I think probably most of you have seen the Sakala wedges and how they describe a series of technological interventions that will, um, at the time of publication, was, it was hoped would take us from the trajectory that um, is business as usual, heading up into the stratosphere of um, major emissions to a flat line and ultimately reduction in emissions. And each of these wedges uh, was describing a particular technological intervention. And I just want to mention briefly that when I started as sustainability director at the university, I was, um, I was told that technology doesn't work. I was told by the people in facilities that, you know, well, we've tried sustainability. Uh, we retrofitted this, we put double envelopes here. We did various things. We had waterless urinals. We've done lots of sustainability and it doesn't work. All those interventions resulted in higher emissions and higher consumption on the part of those buildings. And so that really motivated me to look at behavior as um, an integral part of the equation. And that's what has ultimately brought me here, but also has um, resulted in development of a lot of the programs that, that Zan is going to be talking about. So, um, but the reason that I'm, I'm working on the behavioral wedge is that behavioral interventions, by and large, at least where I come from, still lack credibility. So even though people will say, well, technology doesn't work, they'll also say, but ah, oh, behavior, like forget, what a waste of time is that? You know, that sort of education is just fiddling around the edges. That's not making real change. And so in my, um, where I work, building um, credibility and showing people that we can generate really significant change through behavior is very important. With this audience, I know um, you're all uh, committed to that already, but in the wider community, that is not the case. So um, when the article was written about uh, the technological stabilization wedges, it was intended to show that we can make changes with the technologies that already exist We've got them at our fingertips. We know how to reduce our emissions. We should be doing it. But this is what has happened since. And um, with uh, very few exceptions, we've been increasing our emissions. And those technologies have not helped us. In the same way, they haven't helped us at the University of Toronto. They haven't helped us nationally either. And um, we're deploying them, and they aren't helping. And neither, I'm, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, neither have all the promised technologies for and most of the wedge technologies are on the supply side. Neither have they worked for a variety of reasons, despite the fact they may be able to contribute, I think Paul Hawkins said, up to 80% of our current uh, energy use. Um, they, in practice, we're not putting them in at the rate we, we need to to really make a big difference, and there are reasons for that. Um, and we're in Canada experiencing all of these barriers right now. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a deeply frustrating process to watch. So technology alone is not doing the trip, trick for a number of reasons. I'm going to show some slides which um, are very similar uh, to what Karen was talking about, you know, the traditional model of um, learning, uh, understanding, changing our attitudes because we're so rational and then changing our behavior because we want to bring it into line with our attitudes. But, you know, we here know that that has been demonstrated to not work. <clears throat> and instead, the reverse is much more likely to be the case that um, if we change our behavior, in spite of what we might think or feel, we're much more likely to then change our attitudes to bring it into line with our and our peers' behaviors. And um, then, as we heard, um, earlier today, we will then admit information that coincides with those attitudes and will accept it um, rather than rejecting it out of hand. So, so that's what I'm building on and I also want to refer to the Dietz article um, that was very formative for me as well in defining um, a behavioral wedge and that was a single behavioral wedge of interventions that, that he listed mostly to do with adoption of products and technologies uh, that could um, define a space where we could be active, independent um, of some of the barriers that have held back those technologies previously and that would allow us to really accelerate adoption and maybe take responsibility for up to 20% of emissions or even higher over the next 20 years. 
And so um, this idea really intrigued me. But the more that uh, I thought about it with Zana and my colleague Ellie, we, we felt that really the previous um, description of all those technological wedges could benefit from behavior within each one of those wedges. So I'd like to really describe our hypotheses to you. And this is um, really, I'm defining for you our research program, which we're, we're about to embark on. I'm hoping that you will contribute your ideas and criticisms um, to uh, Zana and me so that we can better define our approach. Because we've really just begun, um, we've done a brief scan of the literature. It has not been exhaustive, but we want to do a much more exhaustive one, drawing on a number of different academic specialties um, so that we can benefit from the findings in each. And we have, um, I want to try and uh, reference uh, Beth Carlin's, I don't know if she's here, Beth Carlin's, uh, hi Beth. Um, you correct me when I get this wrong. Uh, terminology of the, for three out of uh, the four kinds of behavior that we have identified, I think they're really consonant with the three behaviors that she described and defined uh, yesterday. So, so we think that there isn't a behavioral wedge, but there are 15 uh, wedges or 15 um, wedges of four kinds in most of those uh, technolo technical wedges that Sokolow described. And so I'm going to just go through the four kinds of um, categories that we identified and the, kind, the sorts of um, shapes of change. And these are over time, so we're looking at the present on the left, and then the scale of the impact that we can expect to have in terms of uh, emissions. And the first um, is the kind of repetitive behaviors that we've worked on extensively at the University of Toronto. Many of them are very small impact, as um, the previous two speakers have pointed out. Uh, but there's something that everyone can do there. It's a very inclusive kind of process. We've had quite significant success with this in university residences. And I think that Beth uh, described these as um, curtailment. And um, so we have been calling them repetitive behaviors. They're things like switching off the lights, um, unplugging things uh, when students go home for the weekend, very simple uh, behaviors that have to be repeated. So they, they, need to, they need to be ingrained, become habits. And we think that they, based on our data and others, we think that they can um, be responsible for 10 to 15% of uh, reductions in those user-mediated uh, consumption, the user-mediated consumption. So I'm not talking about 15% overall. I'm talking about those, and when we measured it, we were measuring the circuits, which were um, affected by light switches, by, uh, by plug-in um, uses. So we did this funded by an organization that was looking to conserve energy. So the second and larger um, wedge that I want to uh, talk about is behavioral recommissioning and um, maintenance, which was Beth's term, but I think it's involving more than maintenance. And um, again, I'm going to draw on some data uh, from the University of Toronto. We're a very old university. I should just mention the St. George campus is huge. University of Toronto is like a small city. We include nearly 100,000 people. And so our graduating class is each year is enormous. We're a very research uh, heavy university, but we have also very large undergraduate population of uh, about 60,000, over 60,000 students. So it's a huge university. And um, one of our oldest colleges has recently, and I'm sorry to say the only college within our university that signed on to the President's Climate Change Pledge, um, has been very seriously looking at their building use it's a very old building. Their buildings are much older than this one. So they're very constrained by historical regulations as to what they can do. And yet, within three years, they have reduced by 30% their energy consumption. So it's stunning. And they've done it through what I'm calling behavioral recommissioning and maybe um, more often referred to as maintenance by doing things like when they look at the heating for a particular room, they look at how many people are going to be in that room for an hour. And so for a meeting like this one, they'd say, oh, it's pretty full. Those bodies are giving off lots of heat. We can really 
um, ratchet down the amount of heat we're going to be putting into that room. And similarly on weekends and when the college closes over holidays, everything is unplugged. Oh, thanks. Everything is unplugged. So they're taking a very fine-grained approach to dealing with their building, both on the part of the building managers and they're working with the users to discourage behaviors which were previously very common, like students would open their windows when the rooms got too hot in the winter. Um, so they're taking a very fine-grained approach, and so we think that there's huge potential in some of the data that were presented uh, yesterday as well about the failures of lead buildings and the, the um, excellence of non-lead buildings by comparison point to um, similar findings elsewhere. So the Dietz work was largely looking at adoption of energy conserving technologies, or what Beth called efficiency, um, and I think uh, what Rachel called consumption. So it's mostly getting something you didn't have before that's more efficient than what you had previously. And um, when we were looking at this, we, would, we speculated that with these, some of them quite conspicuous uh, forms of consumption, that as a critical mass of people um, choose to install those devices or use those technologies or products, that it'll become um, much easier for others to adopt. And those initial behaviors are going to become much less important as time goes on. And so the behavioral interventions are very important at the beginning and may become less so, um, as we've seen with conspicuous behaviors like recycling or purchasing of plastic bags. I don't know if they're both relevant here, but we had very, very rapid uptake of those because they're highly conspicuous. And so people could see their neighbors uh, representing us a very, very powerful social norm. Um, and then the final one is policy and regulation where, um, you know, in Canada right now, I'm sure we're notorious and you've all heard of our wonderful prime minister. Um, and so, you know, policy and regulation has been a real struggle in our country. It's a struggle in the city, at the city level in Toronto. And so we see that as something that can really benefit from having a critical mass of people making these behavior changes in their lives, changing their attitudes, and ultimately feeling that they're part of an, a community that believes in climate change, that believes that they can have some power to make a difference with climate change, and that they would like to see their governments do the same. So we um, certainly don't see those kinds of changes being influenced behavior by behavior anytime soon, at least for us. But over time, we think that there's the opportunity to really have a big impact. I want to make quickly um, a point that others have made that, um, and that I think is really critical, is that we can't look at these behavior changes alone, really will only be effective when we look at technology together with behavior change, when we redesign technology to take into account behavior, and when we look at changing behavior to take into account the potential for the use of technology and the potential to maximize its impact. And same with system design, and by that I mean things like policy, regulation, human um, HR rules in terms of work time that we heard about from Juliet Shore, all those sy systemic rules that define the playing field for us and that allow places like Vancouver to do such stunning work because they have fantastic uh, targets for emissions reductions in British Columbia that help to facilitate those kinds of changes. So we need all three of these things to be working in concert. We should not be designing, as I did initially, uh, behavior change programs that look exclusively at a single target and a single mechanism, but instead look at how we can integrate all three of these. And it's a big challenge for us to do so. It's really, I feel, the key challenge for me is to figure out how to do that, how to work with the people that are experienced only in the technology or only in the policy and regulation and build bridges so that um, behavior change has credibility with them but also that we can figure out how to coordinate campaigns in such a way that we maximize our impact. And I'm certainly not there yet in my work. But one of the things that I want to show them is that if we add those um, different uh, behavioral approaches together and look at the kind of impact they might have on a single wedge, and I argue that all but um, the first two wedges, all the technological wedges, which are pretty well all but the first two that Sokolo um, defined, would benefit from all of these approaches and behavior change in all of these areas. And just our very initial scan of data gives us um, 
And of course, there are going to be overlaps, which I'm not showing here because um, I'm just trying to, to show the kind of scale of each of these independent impacts when added together. It really is going to be very profound. And so behavior change is a, is a critically important tool that we really need to explore more. Um, I hope to do so in my future work, but I think we need to look at how these things overlap, particularly at the policy and regulation. And um, so our, our hypothesis in brief is that repeated conservation behaviors um, yield savings of 10 to 15 percent. That's what we found for discretionary energy use. Uh, One-time adoption behaviors um, can increase uh, savings by even more. That behavioral recommissioning or maintenance probably has the greatest, the pot greatest potential of all three to really reduce our emissions. And I think that uh, working in the site here for this conference has given us some further ideas, at least it's given me some further ideas about behavioral recommissioning, just looking at how they're managing the building and our use of it here. And finally, um, as I think in Canada, at least the BC example shows really clearly progressive policies and regulations and compliance with them can make the biggest difference of all when we can get those into place through marshalling all the people who are motivated uh, by the changes that they're making in their behavior in these other three spheres. So um, I in really invite uh, comment, critiques, and suggestions for this future work. It's really um, a working hypothesis hypothesis, and uh, I look forward to hearing your suggestions for how we can do a better job with it. Thank you.